going to talk about today that oftentimes there's something that keeps us from loving our neighbor. We love the idea of anonymity. We, we love to be isolated in a lot of ways. In fact, if, if you work in a place where you're around people all day long, you'll often find that when you come home at, at the end of the day, all you want to do is just detach, right? You want to get away from people. You want to turn the phone off. You don't really want to answer the phone when, when people are calling. You want to close the garage door as quickly as you can because there's something about coming home at the end of the day that we want to just be able to detach. And yet what Jesus calls us to, and we studied this last week and we'll jump back into it today, is that it's so important for us to love our neighbor as ourselves. Which if you look at the grand scheme of scripture, right, from the book of Genesis all the way to the Gospels, all of the Old Testament points towards Jesus saying there is a Messiah, there is one coming who's going to save you from all of your sins. He's going to be the, the savior of all of the world. He's going to come, live a perfect life, and then die in your place so that you don't have to face the discipline for your sins, which is eternal suffering in hell. That's what you deserve for your sin. So all of the Old Testament says there is a Messiah coming, and, and all of the Old Testament points to Jesus. And then after you get past the Gospels, you get to the rest of the New Testament, where everything is pointing back to Jesus, saying, that guy Jesus, he is the Messiah. He is the one that was promised for so long that would come and save us from our sins. He's the guy. And Jesus, knowing that there's so much to be done in the world, that his mission is not done, but that his message of this gospel, his goodness, his grace, which we've sung about this morning, this message needs to go farther than what he could just do in his time on the earth. And so he invests in his disciples for three years, teaching them, giving them time to imitate him, and then sending them out so that they could innovate those ways in their own context, in their own ways. And if you were Jesus, and your mission was to bring good news to the entire world, and you were sitting around a conference table, and you were coming up with the best strategy for how this would happen, and you were laying out marketing plans and, and, and all kinds of ways for you to spread this, and, and ways that you could be in the media, and, and your strategy team was coming up with the best way to bring this news to the rest of the world, it probably looked pretty complex. There'd be a lot of moving pieces to it because, man, if we're going to reach the whole world, then we've got a lot of work to do. And so we better launch this, in, this initiative and we better get this going and, and start that thing over there. And yet Jesus, the way his strategy, which, and I hope we wrestle with this this morning, his strategy for bringing good news to the entire world is wrapped up in his simple statement, love your neighbor as yourself. Have you ever considered that the good news that you have in Jesus was simply meant to be shared in your neighborhood? And that if we all did that, it would become a worldwide movement. It's all that Jesus gave his disciples. Love your neighbor as yourself. Because it's in that love, it's in that kind of grace that good news is not just talked about or preached about, but it's shown, it's demonstrated. So this morning, as we wrestle through this idea, who is our neighbor? We want to take a look at the story of the Good Samaritan. In fact, you've probably heard of this story. It's talked about frequently. The phrase Good Samaritan is often used all over the place. Today, we're going to take a look at that and ask the question, who is our neighbor? So grab a Bible on your table, open up to the book of Luke. We're going to be in chapter 10 this morning. Luke is one of the four Gospels. It's about two-thirds of the way through the Bible. Um, if you're in Matthew or Mark, you're coming up on Luke. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. Those are the four Gospels. We're going to be in Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25. By the way, if you don't have a Bible at home, um, take one of these Bibles home with you today. It's our gift to you. We want to make sure that you have a Bible that you can be reading throughout the week. Luke chapter 10 beginning in verse 25, and follow along with us here as we're going to 
Just read the story of the Good Samaritan, hear how this story comes about, why Jesus is telling this story, and then draw some implications from it for us as we look to learn how to love our neighbor. Luke chapter 10, beginning in verse 25, follow along. On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, this teacher of the law, very highly religious person, a guy who loves the letter of the law, who loves to, to really just shove it in people's faces, right? He wants to show the world that he is a better, more religious person than they are. And so hearing Jesus kind of scandalous teaching, he wants to try and trip Jesus up because if, if, if Jesus will, will slip up and say something that isn't in accordance, isn't in agreement with God's word, then they can persecute him, they can put him on trial, and they can even have him sentenced to death. They're all plotting to get rid of Jesus because he's this guy that's saying, all those promises you've heard about for all these years, all of your ancestors were promised a Messiah. Jesus is saying, I'm him. And for all these teachers of the law, that didn't really jive with what they were teaching. So here's this overly religious person wanting to trip up Jesus. So he asks him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus asks, what is written in the law? How do you read it? So this religious person answers, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, you've answered it correctly. Do this and you will live. Here's an interesting phrase in verse 29. But this religious man, he wanted to justify himself. So he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Who is my neighbor? It's interesting that his perspective and the reason why he's wanting to ask this question is because he wants Jesus to describe a neighbor in such a way that this religious guy will be able to check it off his, on his list and say, you know what, I do donate to that charity. That is my neighbor. I'm following the law, right? His whole perspective is, I want to show that I'm better at following the law than everybody else. He's overly religious. So he wants Jesus to fall into his trap and describe neighbor in such a way that this guy will be able to say, yep, I'm good at that. Here's what Jesus says in verse 30. A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him, and went away, leaving him half dead. Verse 31. A priest happened to go, be going down the same road, and when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. Hmm. So too, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, pass by on the other side. Now pause right there before we get to the Samaritan. This person walking from Jerusalem to Jericho is probably a Jew, probably somebody who would fall into the right of, of having a priest. So the priest would be somebody who would be teaching this guy. Okay, as he's walking from Jerusalem to Jericho, this priest would probably very readily identify this man as somebody who's a part of his church, a part of his religion, right? So if you're thinking that if anybody should reach out and help this guy, it would clearly be a priest who believes the same things as this guy. But what does the priest do? Kind of skirts around the side of him, kind of pretending like he's not, not there. Then a Levite, and to us that term really doesn't have a lot of significance. A Levite, what is that? A Levite is actually, if you go back to Old Testament times, the tribe of Levi is where priests and people who worked in the church would come from that tribe. They were set apart as holy to become priests. So, so here's a guy who's also coming from a very religious background who gets the idea of love your neighbor as yourself, would have heard that before from Old Testament teachings, knows that that's a good idea, and yet this guy too, a fellow Jew, kind of skirts around the side, pretending like he's not there. But then, finally, the third guy comes walking by. But here's the thing about the third guy, a Samaritan. You see, a Samaritan and a Jew would never get along. For a Samaritan to help a Jew 
would be probably like the modern day equivalent of a terrorist helping an American. That's how, that's how bad it was for Samaritans and Jews. You should never be caught talking to a Samaritan if you're a Jew. And if you're a Samaritan, you should never be caught being anywhere near a Jew. You should always stay far apart. You should never be around them. And yet it's the Samaritan who helps this man. Look here in verse 33. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. If you have your own Bible or if you have an app on your phone that you're following along with or you want to take the Bible that you have home with you today, I would underline that phrase right there. He took pity on him. He went to him, bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, took him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two silver coins and gave them to the innkeeper. He said, look after him, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Talk about going the extra mile. Literally. Went out of his way to take care of this man who culturally he should never, ever speak to or touch. And yet he takes the time to go care for this man. And so Jesus asks in verse 36, which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law, a.k.a. overly religious man, replied, the one who had mercy on him. And Jesus said, go and do likewise. Now what's interesting from this, this story is that as we contemplate the question, who is our neighbor, there's a few implications that come from this. Number one is this. You don't get to choose who your neighbors are. You don't get to choose what they look like, how similar they are to you, if they have the same skin color, if they speak the same language, if they have the same value system, if they have the same world perspective, the world view that you do, you don't get to choose that. And yet that doesn't change the way Jesus says, love your neighbor as you would love yourself. Hmm. You don't get to choose your neighbors. <laughs> now, some of you are thinking, well, I could just move. And then I'd get to choose my neighbors a little bit better, right? But what if God has you in the neighborhood that you're in right now for the specific reason of loving them just as the Good Samaritan loves this Jewish man? What if God is calling you to love people right where they're at, even if they wouldn't agree with you on everything that you believe? I mean, what if God's calling you to love people somebody, to love your neighbor, your co-worker, people around you, your literal neighbors in your neighborhood, and to love them without any agenda, without any assumptions that just because you're going to be nice to them, that mm, you're going to get something back in return. What if he's just simply calling you to love them, maybe for years on end, without ever seeing them do anything back, and the only thing you're called to do is to love them without any expectation of return? Because that's exactly the kind of love that God's calling us to show to our neighbors. That's the kind of love that's demonstrated for us by the Good Samaritan. He even pays for this guy's stay at the inn. He pays for his medical expenses. You don't get to choose your neighbors. Instead, God puts you among your neighbors. Second implication that we draw from this story <laughs> is that oftentimes, hmm, oftentimes it will cost you a whole lot to love your neighbor. It costs you time. It costs you energy. Sometimes it costs a lot of money. Sometimes it costs you the thing that you don't want to give at the end of the day. Because at the end of the day, you've been giving all day long. You've been giving of yourself. You've been hard at work. And at the end of the day, all you want is for somebody to spend a little bit on you. For somebody to invest just a little bit on you. And yet what we see 
in this story is that God's calling us to sacrifice, to give of our time, to give of our money, to give of our energy, even if the tank is pretty empty. It's going to cost. See, but even though you don't get to choose your neighbors, and even though it's going to cost, the greatest thing that we learn from this story is that it will, it will change somebody's life. If Jesus has this grandiose scheme for how he's going to bring good news to the entire world, and it's simply stated in the idea of loving your neighbor as yourself, then I guarantee you it's going to change somebody's life. In the, story, or in the book, The Art of Neighboring, there's a story where 20 pastors in the Denver area get together. And they come together and they invite the mayor of Denver to come and, and speak to them. And, and they have one question for the mayor of Denver. They say, what is it we can do collectively as a group of churches to serve this city, to love this city? And the mayor went on to list all of the deficiencies in the city and all the, the crime rates and, and the hardships at home and the broken relationships and the divorce rate and, and all of these things that were bad about the city. And you know what he says to him? He says, if only people would learn to love their neighbors. Because I believe it's relationships that are going to be the thing that transform this city. He said, all the time we get petitions written and things signed, letters written to us asking for the government to start new programs, to, to launch new things, to in, initiate different, all kinds of things, to be able to meet the needs and deficiencies of the city. But I got to tell you, the government just isn't that great at those kinds of things. If only we could have relationships in our neighborhoods, I think things would begin to transform. And the mayor left, and all the pastors are left there sitting around these tables saying, man, do we feel ashamed or what? Because if there's one thing Jesus holds forward, it's to love God, to love your neighbor. A few weeks later, they got their butts kicked again by another official in, in the city, and she came and spoke. <laughs> and it's amazing what she had to say. She said, she said this very thing. There is not a noticeable difference in how Christians and non-Christians neighbor in our community. She said, if you were to go and take, take a poll or research every neighborhood in our city, you would not notice a difference between Christians and the way they love their neighbors and non-Christians how they love their neighbors. I would think if there's one thing that we should be excellent at, it's loving our neighbors. Regardless of who they are, where they come from, what they believe, we should just be excellent at loving our neighbors. Hmm. And so as we look at this, who is our neighbor? The people around us. I want you to think um, from that exercise we did last week. Last week we, we drew a, a diagram, nine boxes all together, three rows of three, and, uh, and in each of those boxes, we tried to list the names of our eight geographically closest neighbors in our neighborhood. And if you could list your eight, you were in the top 10% of Americans who could list at least one name of somebody who lives in each of the eight closest houses to yours. And then we asked, do you know something about them? Do you know a hobby? Do you know an interesting thing about them that you've learned from conversation? And if you could do that for each of your eight closest neighbors, then you're the top 3% of Americans who can actually do that. And then we asked, do you know something intimate about them? I mean, do you know something more serious, something that they've shared with you in confidence? Do you know something about them in that way? And if you could, you're in the top 1% of Americans who can actually do that with their eight closest neighbors. So this morning, I want you to consider again your eight closest neighbors. And I want you to think about what are the, what are the things, the tendencies that we have in our lives, the, the ways that we act, the tendencies we have that keep us from loving our neighbor. And you might have more than this, but I, I want to just suggest three of them. And maybe you want to write these down because these are probably the things that you wrestle with the most or things that challenge you the most because these are tendencies you have that will keep you from loving your neighbor. The first one is isolation. We love to isolate ourselves from our neighbors, don't we? 
Again, it's that whole mentality. We've been at work all day. We've been around people all day. Last thing we want to do is be around people some more in the evening. So we close the door, close the blinds, close the garage door as quickly as we can without talking to the people around us. It's our tendency. It's what we do. We, we have a tendency to isolate ourselves, to be individualistic, to not rely on the people around us, but to simply separate ourselves from them. Number one is isolation. Number two is we have a fear of the unknown. We're not sure how different our neighbors are from us. And so because of that, we're not sure if we'll be able to have conversation with them. We're not sure if they would, if, if they would like the food that we have to make for them. We're not sure if, if, uh, if culturally we would agree on things. You know, what if we start talking about this? Or what if, what if this came up? Or, or whatever it may be. There's unknown things. There's things that we're uncertain of that, that make us fearful of simply having a conversation with our neighbors that we become paralyzed and separate ourselves from them. So we like to isolate ourselves. We're fearful of the unknown. And number three, the tendency we have for why we don't connect with our neighbors be- is usually because there's some kind of misunderstanding. There's a story in the book, The Art of Neighboring, of uh, a guy who um, is observing over the course of a couple of months that his neighbor is really not maintaining her yard very well. In fact, the yard is overgrown. There's weeds everywhere. Uh, the house is in poor condition. The garage door is kind of falling off its hinges. There's two cars that are broken down in the driveway, and it's, it's just a real eyesore on the entire block in the neighborhood. And so he calls the HOA, right? And tells them to get some officials out there right away and take care of this, this business because that's not good for our neighborhood. That doesn't look good. That doesn't reflect well on the rest of us. And so he calls the HOA, gets them to come in, and, and they give a citation and, and a warning and everything, stick the fine up on the, on the front door, and, and a couple of days go by, and this guy is having a conversation with one of the neighbors, and they start talking about the house across the street. And this other neighbor says, oh, yeah, haven't you heard? Um, That woman lives alone by herself, had to quit her job because she's been spending every hour of every day with her mom who was recently diagnosed with cancer, and she hasn't been able to take care of her place. It's interesting, from afar, we can make a lot of assumptions of things that our neighbors do wrong, that we would like to fix. And so we make up these preconceived notions. We have these assumptions that because of what we see, let's not build a relationship with them because they don't value. I mean, come on, clean up your yard, take care of some things, right? Instead of walking up and saying, hey, how can we help? How can we be a blessing to you? So I want to suggest two things that will help us overcome those tendencies. The first one is this, flexibility. We need to build a little more flexibility into our lives. We need to create a little bit of margin around us that that it's not going to stop us from loving our neighbor if it means that we're five minutes late to something else. or, Or we can't let our agenda run us. But instead, we've got to take it by the horns and say, my neighbors come first. They're a higher priority. I'm going to invest in them. So let's build a little bit of flexibility into our relationships, into our schedules. And also, number two is compassion. I think a lot of times we spend a lot of time looking at people, seeing faces, and not considering the story behind the face. We see numbers. We see blurs of people as we pass them on the road. We see slow drivers in the left-hand lane who deserve a few words as we go passing by them, right? You know you shouldn't be in the left-hand lane, not even taking a moment to consider what they've been through that day or what they're on their way to or the hospital that their family member has just been admitted to instead of having some compassion on them for right where they're at. Hmm. This conversation of what it means for us to love our neighbors needs to have a little 
traction in our lives, where the rubber meets the road, where things get real. And this statement of love your neighbor as yourself doesn't just stay in a church building noticed as a really good religious statement that, that is good to say and, 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 and healthy for us to, to memorize. But instead, somewhere along the line, it's got to start to take traction in our lives. And to be honest with you, the motivation for that is not going to come from me saying from the stage this morning, go out and do it. Be more flexible. Be more compassionate. And the story of the Good Samaritan, while it's good and gives us an incredible example of how we should live our lives and how we should love and have compassion on the people around us, it's not just about being morally good, but it's about pointing to how Jesus has stopped for us as we've been beat up, as, we, as we've been burned out, as we've been marginalized, as, we, as we've been cast aside, as we've been wounded. See, the beautiful glimpse that we see in the Good Samaritan is not just how you need to be a better person, how I need to be a better person, but we see a glimpse of Jesus where Jesus steps in, takes the time, and takes your place on the cross to demonstrate love in an unconditional way, taking your sin upon himself and calling you his son, his daughter. You see, as his son, as his daughter, we simply get to be a representation of that kind of love, that kind of grace in our neighborhoods. That's the invitation I want to extend to you. That's the challenge I want to extend to you today. Go home today. Sit down with your family or get some friends around in your apartment complex. Say, let's throw a barbecue. Let's get to know our neighbors. Let's not just assume that everybody's okay and they don't need anybody to love on them. They're tough enough. They're, they're getting by just fine. But let's get to know our neighbors. Let's take Jesus seriously here. Let's invest in our neighborhood. Let's love our neighbor as ourselves. In the next couple of weeks, we're going to wrestle with the logistics of that. How exactly do you love your neighbor? What does that look like for us in our context, in our neighborhoods together?